This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Rock and Roll Denim, Bill Fick Ford, the WCRA, and Resist All. Attention all rodeo athletes. Join us for the Cowtown Christmas Championship Rodeo in December. Over $360,000 in prize money in the historic Cowtown Coliseum in Fort Worth, December 14th through 17th. And no entry fees. Qualify using the VRQ for the Triple Crown of Rodeo 1 million cash bonus. Featured on a CBS network broadcast. To get started, go to the App Store, download the WCRA Rodeo app, and hit nominate. This is your chance to rodeo in December. Nominate today or visit us at WCRARodeo.com. Guys, another year has ticked by. Challenging year, but there was somebody you could rely on if you needed a new Super Duty pickup, and that was Bill Fick Ford. Once again, the number one Super Duty dealer in the entire country. You guys have seen what's going on in the car business, in the truck business. You're seeing trucks being sold for thousands above MSRP. Well, if you go to Bill Fick Ford, it doesn't matter where you are at in the continental U.S. He will take care of you. He will stand by the product and he will not take advantage of you. Guys, Bill Fick Ford is the only place you can go in 2022 for a no bull discount. Bill Fick Ford. What sets Resist All apart is the legacy of the cowboys who wear the brand. These traditions are passed down from fathers to sons, from heroes to future champions. Since 1927, Resist All has been handcrafting the finest American-made cowboy hats. Generation after generation, we live it every day. This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage, and I am Chance Conrado. On this episode of the podcast, I've got my buddy Ian Desmond. Ian is a two-time MLB All-Star. He is a three-time Silver Slugger Award winner. He's got a lot of really great insight in life. He's a philosophical guy and and just a really good dude overall, and this is a super valuable podcast uh, for, for really anyone, so I encourage you to listen to it fully, especially the end. Check it out. I saw his there, and I was like, man, this would be really bad if my phone just started going off. I think we've had somebody answer it once, but it was the FBI, so that was cool. <laughs> Whoa. You know what? I mean, that's flattering that you flew all the way here, never done a baseball podcast, considering that was your entire life, career, and plan for everything. You didn't even show up for one of those. No. Yeah. You're our second baseball player, too. I heard. Tyler, I actually watched, well, I saw. Taylor? You had, he's a cool dude. Taylor. You'd like him. you get along with him. Yeah? Yeah, he's a real cowboy. Yeah, well, that's pretty cool. It is cool. I think you'd like him. You guys play for the same team. But, all right, so clearly we're probably not going to talk a whole lot about rodeo here. But one of the things that I think would be really great, and you're very humble and a well-spoken guy, is to explain a little bit about your life and then, like, your mindset on what it takes. Because when you look at rodeo and you just remove the fact that it is this standalone thing, it's just a sport, right? And it takes a ton of dedication and a good mindset to be able to thrive in that but i mean baseball is a whole nother level i mean the amount of depth of people you're competing with to achieve what you wanted to achieve i think it's pretty amazing and i think it'd be really beneficial to the people listening to this podcast to hear your mindset now that you're retired and all that and then we can talk about some other shit too yeah tell me when to go i mean i mean it's now yeah so i mean (laughs) we uh we as baseball players i think have a tremendous hill to climb, right? You know, it's not only at the major league level, but the minor leagues, like you're talking about, you know, just finally now minor leaguers are starting to get some of these benefits, you know, non-poverty wages, you know, which I think some people in the rodeo, you know, circuit can understand, you know, where it's like you're traveling around to these small towns, you know, restaurants are closed by the time you're done, you know, what do you eat? Where do you stay? You know, that type of thing. But even before that, you know, you've got, like right now, my, I have an 11-year-old son. My, he's my oldest, 11, 9, and 7. And, you know, there's already parents that are prepping their kids to be, you know, major league baseball players. You know, and I tell people, you know, if your kid isn't in the car waiting to go to practice, telling you, come on, come on, mom, come on, dad, come on, dad, 
you know, that kid probably isn't going to make it. You know, so I would say 98% of the major leaguers are those kids. They're in the car. They're passionate. They're dying to get to practice. They're dying to get to games. And you have to think that has to last from 10 till 35, you know. So that drive, that focus, that level of sacrifice, they're not worried about going to the pool with their buddies. They're not worried about going to, you know, parties and things like that. I mean, it takes it takes the sacrifice. And so that doesn't stop from 10 till, like I said, 35. Yeah. Well, and that's a really interesting perspective and the way it relates. And you've got – you've had some interesting – when you started kind of coming to the rodeos a little bit and you went to the NFR and, and saw that and then you heard about how it operates – you had some really interesting perspectives, which I'd like to get in later, but I think there's more probably we could talk about, not so much about baseball, but about like you specifically and what, what it was like for somebody. And when did you know that that's something you wanted to do, like pursue an athletic career? Because I mean, like you just said, you have to be a two percenter, you know, with a mindset. And then you also have to have the physical ability to even, even get there. Yeah, so you said a little bit about me. <clears throat> so my biological dad died when I was a baby, 18 months old, and I got to five years old. My mom married a, another guy, my stepdad, and so we were at you know a, a private school um, until like half of fifth grade. I switched over from from there to public school. When I got there, I had been I had at the private school. I've been using my stepdad's last name. Now he he didn't adopt me, but I think because it was private school, you can just use whatever name you want. And so when I got to public school. You know, my mom kind of presented it to me like, hey, you know, you kind of have to pick which last name you want to use. And, you know, part of my rationale behind picking Desmond was because it would look sick on the back of a jersey. <laughs> and I hadn't used Desmond up to that point. You know, like I had been Sharon and I had played sports with Sharon on the back of my name and on the back of my jersey. And so, it, I don't know, it was probably around 12 years old where I started thinking like back of the jersey, you know, in the show. Yeah, that makes sense. But I think one of the ben really beneficial things that people, because rodeo is such a different thing, right? Like if you wanted to be to pro rodeo tomorrow, you could pay the membership, get a permit, fill that permit and get a pro card. Now you're not going to get into every rodeo, but it's so different. So you get, you get two different, I mean, you get like 20 different types of people, but there's big differences, right? There's the people like you or like anybody who goes professional in a mainstream sport, right? Who is dedicated. In fact, we just had Sage Kimji on here a few weeks ago. And I mean, he's one of those guys, like, he's like, I'm not going to the bar or at Calgary. I'm going to bed, like not partying, but then you have dudes and I call them the surf bums or rodeo who can just get by on it. Right. And it's not just yeah. people, but I mean, it's just one of those things Like you could almost escape reality. And I know this is some people probably don't want to hear stuff like that, but I would have been that guy. I would have just freaking skated by. That's what I did my entire freaking life until I got adult enough to realize that's not what you're supposed to do. But, I mean, what what were the struggles to keep your, your head right and your mindset right? And well, like, I think it's different. I, yeah. I mean, I think there is two different – and there's two different in the big leagues, and I think that's part of the reason why my decision to stop playing was there is, like, there is two different avenues. You know, you have, like, that – that lifer type guy, you know, like that it's in their blood, you know, like that's the way I was where like I, I thought when I was going to die on a baseball field, you know, I thought I was going to play baseball. I was going to make it to the major leagues. I was going to come home and play men's league softball. And I was going to play that until I was a hundred years old and I was going <laughs> to die on the field, you know? And like, that was the mentality I had as a kid where like, I couldn't see myself doing anything else, you know? And, and then, you know, I was playing and like, you know, I, I made it to the major leagues you know, guys were going out, hanging out, having fun. We would go, you know, any given city. We'd land. We'd go to dinner. We'd hang out, have a couple, of, you know, beers, have fun, tell stories, mess around, whatever. And then, like, as the, my career started to go on, it started to become, like, the money started to get higher. Athletes started to put a little bit more emphasis on their bodies. And I see it now, like – I follow Shane Hanchi, you know, Shane Hanchi through you guys, you know, I've been able to kind of make a small relationship with him, but I see him, you know, like his, his dedication, you know, he's always like, it seems like he's, you know, health conscious. He's, you know, putting in the time in the gym. He's extremely focused. He's, he shows a lot of passion and energy when he's out there. And, you know, then like there's, 
like in the baseball world, like there's the guys that are doing the same thing. Like they only drink water, you know, like they're going to the gym. They have personal trainers. They have personal hitting coaches. They have all this private, you know, like self equity building, you know, type stuff. And then there's the guys who are just like completely, it's in their blood. Like they show up, they don't watch any video. They don't do any studying. Like they're relying on just like instincts that have been, gained over their whole life you know so there is that like that surf bum mentality in baseball i think it's fading and that to me kind of like i couldn't be the other guy i tried and it wasn't really that fun yeah but you also were a little different like you i mean i don't know how young you got married but i mean you've been with your wife chelsea forever since like you started right yeah i mean we met when we were 10 years old you know we, we got married 23 years old had kids by 24, we got five kids now. I'm 36, you know. So, I mean, yeah, we kind of just like bam, 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 bam. Yeah. So, I mean, you you were doing a lot, and you had kids and marriage and all that, like in the early days of your career, before a lot of the big accomplishments that you've had, right? And do you think that played a part into it? Because I know if I wouldn't have knocked up my girlfriend now wife, there wouldn't be no Gage podcast. <laughs> well, it, it's funny, man. Like I had a I had my first son, and I won a silver slugger. So I was like, dang, you know, that's, that worked pretty good. <laughs> so and then I had another son and won another silver slugger and was like, ooh, okay, you know, let's just keep out having kids. So I had my third son and won another silver slugger. And then I was like, all right, one more. And then I had a girl and I stopped winning silver sluggers and was kind of like, okay, this doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it was the boys though, right? Yeah, the boys, yeah. yeah. But it's cool, you know, because my boys got to see, I think it's cool that my boys got to see like the baseball life. They've been, they've been on the field for a home run derby. They got to go to the all-star game. They got to meet all the cool players. And now, like, my girls are getting to see this totally new side of me, which is, you know, a completely new life for me. But I feel like I'm finally – I'm doing – not finally. I'm doing something again that I'm really enjoying doing. Yeah, because, I mean, that brings up a good good topic, right? Because how do you balance that, right? When you get to the level – and, I mean, I want to hear a little bit because this is stuff – we've literally never talked about baseball one time ever, anytime I've ever been around you. Yeah. We're talking about our selfish horse crap all the time, trying to force that on you. Like, come on, let's ride. You know, I know you're a baseball – I know you're playing baseball, but get on this one. He'll be fine. He's not going to run you (laughs) into the fence. Yeah, what what do you – I mean – what do you want to talk about in regards to baseball? I mean, we, uh, we well, I, mean, could, I could literally so much talk the, about it. It's not so much the baseball part that I, I necessarily care about. It could be whatever sport, right? But this happens to be you're a base, we're mm-hmm. a baseball player and a really highly achieved one. I mean, when it comes to baseball, and I'm no expert, trust me, I had to Google this stuff. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, I mean, you won three Silver Sluggers, two All-Star games. I mean, talking to Taylor, um, who I like a lot. He's in, he's still an up and comer, right? He's younger and all that. And if you listen to the podcast we had with him and he's currently pitching for the Rangers, you know, he was in that, he was in the triple a and had got called up and still in that, you know, base salary position and, and working his way up. But you achieve, you know, massive, massive things for baseball players, let alone just regular humans. Right. And I know maybe, that's one of those topics that you're like, ah, you know, because you, you you never you're like the most humble guy I've ever met who's achieved a lot of things. Thanks. And that's a really good quality about you. And that's why one of the reasons I like you a lot um, is you would never know that you've achieved things you have. You just just kind of go. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I think track. that's kind of just the way it is. That's you know, that's the way I, I try to talk to my kids, where it's like you know, you got to let the bat do the talking, right? You know? And you know, that's. That's the way I was. That's the way I was kind of raised up. Fortunately, I was able to have – I always had coaches that didn't have kids on the team. You know, and I think for me that really helped me because they kind of looked at me like just like everybody else, and it was like, hey, you know, like you're either going to play or you're not going to play. You know, like this isn't about, you know, I'm doing this like daddy ball type thing. You know, like you're going to have to run. You're going to have to, you know, do all the stuff. And – I was kind of taught the right way from the very beginning in my eyes, you know, and I think now the game is a little bit different. And so, you know, I just, I just kind of do what I do, you know, and I, I wanted to be, I always wanted to kind of be there for the manager. That was kind of always my thing is like, you know, you know, if you know what a metronome is, you know, in like the music industry, you know, like I wanted to be that, like I wanted, I didn't want to be the bass, you know, I didn't want to be the, the lead singer, 
I just wanted to be the guy in the back that was just going to be there and was going to be like that steady force every single day. Like, you know, whether it was, you know, hurt or not hurt or it was great one day, bad one day. Like when I got to the field, I was going to try to be the same guy every single day. And over the course of, you know, whatever it was, 12 years, 11 years, whatever, you know, it just kind of added up to what it was. You know, you are what you are. You know, you play every day. And at the end of the day, you know, the baseball card is going to say what it says. Right. And fortunately, like you said, I was able to do some good things. Yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. And I think that's no matter what you're doing, right? I think that's all you can hope for, right? But what is some of the things, like, from a mentality standpoint, right? Like, if you were going to offer some nuggets of, of wisdom to just a person, maybe maybe they're struggling, right? Maybe they, they don't know how to get out of a slump or keep their mind in a positive place, or maybe they can't even get their ass up and get to the gym or change the aspect of their diet or apply for that job or, or whatever, right? I mean, I try to do this show because there's just, I, I mean, it's untold numbers of people who listen to it, which is super cool. It means that we can help some people, and that's important to me. And I think you're the kind of guy who – could offer some of that wisdom to people yeah i mean so so i was watching i, I saw a snidbit of you know a, a podcast that you were doing with a guy and i don't i'm sorry i don't know who he was but yeah he was talking about um you know how he was just going to push this rock up the mountain you know and that was what he was going to do he was just going to sledge it up the mountain as hard as he could and, and once he got to the top he was going to go back down and push another rock up you know and like when I first started my career, that's kind of the mentality I had where like I was, you know, going and, you know, and then as I kind of got a little bit more mature and things started to slow down a little bit for me and not to say that what he's saying is wrong because there's plenty of people that make success pushing the rock up the mountain. But as I kind of got older and like now, even like now I'm kind of like tiptoeing into like the business world and even learning horses, you know, like kind of entering into this lifestyle where it's like, I'm kind of taking the mentality now where, like, I'm going to push the rock up the hill, but I'm going to go around so, like, at times I can stop, you know, and enjoy where I'm at. And that rock isn't going to roll over and crush me on the way back down, you know, once my arms get tired, you know. And so that's more of the mentality that I'm trying trying to take these days where it's like, you know, I'm going up and I'm going to get to the top. I know I'm certain I'm going to get to the top, and I'm kind of, like, making checkpoints along the way, but – I have to stop and enjoy it. Otherwise it's going to fizzle out, you know, or it's going to crush me and everything else is going to be sacrificed in the meantime. Do you feel like that happened in your baseball career at points? Um, I mean, there were certainly times in my career where, you know, I made baseball like a God, you know, like where that was the ultimate, you know, where like there was really nothing more important than, than baseball. And, you know, once I started to have kids, once I started, you know, my wife and I, you know, really started to kind of like bite down and like do this family thing together. You know, I started to kind of realize like I'm not getting the best out of myself by making this the ultimate thing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's tough because like you, like I said earlier, like you have to you have to it has to be your focus. But like like, I, like I, I guess pushing the rock around the mountain thing is like we are pushing the rock up the mountain, but at the same time, like we have to stop and like enjoy it. You know, going back to like 18 years old, you know, I'm in Savannah, Georgia, you know, and playing in the, the South Atlantic League. So you stop in Savannah, Georgia, you stop in Charleston, you go to Augusta, you know, you go to these places and, you know, as a minor leaguer, you're like, 18 years old, like, all you care about is, you know, going out, playing the game, you know, playing in front of thirsty Thursday crowds <laughs> where people are heckling you and people are drunk and, you know, it's rowdy and, you know, but, like, now I look back and, man, like, I was in some of the most beautiful places on the east side of the United States and I didn't even, I never even thought to stop and, like, take anything in, you know, and, like, I kick myself for that now, you know, I, 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 play with guys who would carry around even in the major leagues. I play with guys who would carry around like cameras and things like that. And like, I'd always kind of be like, man, what the heck are these guys doing? Like, where, where are they going to take these pictures? But like, <laughs> you know, you look back, like these guys are going to look back and their kids are going to look back and they're going to have something, you know, I kind of live my life where I was like, you know, I don't really want my kids to know, like we don't have memorabilia up in the house and we don't have like, you know, I don't know. My, my silver sluggers are like tucked behind clothes in my closet 
you know, like I don't want my kids to know me for that. I don't want people that walk into my house to be like, oh, you know, this is, you know, this is your silver slugger. You know, this is who you are. Like, no, I want you to come in my house and feel like you're welcome and, you know, feel like it's just a normal house. I'm trying to live like a normal human being, man. Like, and I think that is kind of a path to success, really. I, I think that would work for anybody. You know, I, I think just kind of like carrying that humility, right? Yeah, which, I mean, I'm sure there's people that, that, who have done similar things to you that aren't that way, right? That, that are, they don't have an ounce of humility in their body. And I don't feel like a guy like you could probably stand being around him very long, but. Well, I mean, I, I think there's just, it's different. Like I, maybe, maybe I would enjoy being around them because maybe I could live a little bit vicariously through them because there are certainly times where I want to like, you know, toot my own horn, so to speak. But like, what's it going to do? You know, like. Yeah. But I mean, Maybe it's a little bit of both, right? Because, I mean, what – and I would love that – now we're getting super philosophical. This is what happens on this show. It's <laughs> yeah. like drink a little bit of whiskey and, like, watch you not drink I know. Your beer is at there, all. like, another – well, it's empty. There's so many So of is them. there another uh, – There's there so a, many. They come in packs of 12. Do you, like, ding you a bell that. if you want another beer or what? No, you pull the ponytail on that guy. <laughs> you right. just pull the back of the ponytail. Is that what that is, a pony? Uh, How you rock what do you pony? call it, Ty? Thank you, Ty. I, you I guess do you it, call it a ponytail. You do it to yourself. You know that when you do the pony, the samurai ponytail, it's going to get brought up at some point. I was just, in I fact, was I think you, you were going to wear a cowboy hat because the last time I saw you, you were like kind of like oh, stepping yeah, into the up. cowboy hat world. All right. I don't think you wore another one since that day. I still have that one. Damn. That's right. I did give it to you. It was a gift. It's uh, hanging on a shelf right now. Yeah, he's a hang a hat on the wall kind of guy, apparently. Oh, no, no, it's on the wall. It's on the shelf right now. You should put it on a wall with the rest of your hats. You were telling us about that. Let me put it. Hats and cats for Ty. Hats and cats. Mm. Yeah. Cats might not Big down. cat guy. Big cat guy. Don't own a cat myself. I got a, I got a barn cat. It's different. You got to have barn cats. Yeah. You got those rats. Mm. All right. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Back to that. We were but, getting philosophical. Uh, I know. And then beer and then ponytails. And this always happens. I'm really <laughs> bad at this. But... Um, like when, when you look back and it's really always, it, it's really interesting to talk to people who've achieved a lot and see what they think about this stuff. Cause I feel like people who are stuck in like the, the, the normal grind of life, which is, is okay. I think it's a good thing actually. Like I think there's so much pressure from social medias and things that everybody has to try to do these big dramatic things. And I think that causes people a lot of stress and depression and things like that, but like when you do look look at that, right, and and you what you had said about maybe you would get something out of those guys, and, and I think about this stuff too. But like w- when you look at what life is, right, like what 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 do you think life means? Because I always wonder that. I'm always constantly thinking and asking people a lot on this show, like what do you, what do you think the purpose of all this is, and and in each moment, because some people look at it and they're like, well, as soon as the moment's gone, it's gone. I've been like that a lot. It's like, I can't, I can't ever think about a memory. Cause why? Yeah. I mean, I mean, we trying to go to church here. I mean, I mean, so, so I don't go to church. I know you well, guys, go. I do. I do, but I used to, you know, so I think there's, you know, I think there's that and we could definitely go down that road. Um, but I, I think that, you know, we certainly need to enjoy and find joy in what we're doing, right? I mean, there's the, there's like the, the joy of doing something. And then there's like the joy of sharing it with everybody else on social media. You know, the joy of like what the comments say, right? And my wife and I were talking about this last night, like, you know, let's go on a vacation and not tell anybody or show anybody and see how much fun we have. You know, now all of it, like everything is about like, you know, these families, you know, every, every family, every professional athlete, it's like a wife and a husband. And, you know, they're, they're showing everybody how awesome their life is, but like, you know, five kids, we've been, we've known each other since we were 10 years old. Like there's times where it's like not really Instagram worthy, (laughs) (laughs) you know, there's a lot of times, you know, and, um, I just think that there's, there's, like I said, there's joy in like life. And then there's like joy in sharing it with Instagram and like, what the comments say and like finding joy and like people saying, Oh, I love your vacation. Your family's so cute. You know, like, Oh, you know, 
blah 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 you know it's blah 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 is how i see it, it, is, yeah. it and it really is but i think there's like that like you said like that depression and anxiety and stress of like trying to live up to like the fake joy yeah well because we live in this weird world where most people are so plugged in that somebody was telling me this really funny thing like it was it was a friend of mine that i went to high school with we were talking about he's still uh, you met him yeah he, he actually came to your house that time with me the real whole, jack guy real jack real small but real jack <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah he looked like you could have been related except for a whole foot shorter than you but you know so what was he telling you well so we were talking about this it might not have been him now i'm gonna feel like a jackass if it wasn't but uh it was somebody who's a friend who was yeah. jacked um but talking about how like at a high school party right like every, we didn't have those, these yeah. and everybody was talking to each other and you're doing shit. And now you, it doesn't matter what it is. You're like this, mm-hmm. like you're going to business meetings with people and everybody, like if they got their wives, they're like this. Yeah. And I think you that, can't connect with anybody. No, but now. I think that's, that goes back to like, you know, so on the plane right here, I'm sitting next to a, a woman, um, who her husband and I didn't, we didn't know, we didn't know this when we sat down, but after talking to her for two hours, her husband was a minor league coach for the pirates Mm -hmm. for like 50 years. I mean, this guy's a lifer and we're talking and we're talking and talking. And, you know, we, we both kind of came to the agreement that like the, the minor leagues are great. You know, I've thoroughly enjoyed the minor leagues. I was 18 years old. Like they called and said, Hey, we're drafting you. And like, I was like, all right, come over and I'll sign this contract. And the next, next day I left and was like, at the field, you know, <laughs> ready to go. Like there was no negotiation. There was no anything. I was like, bring it over. I'll sign it. I'm out of here. Right. Um, and maybe like a small nugget there is like my agent at the time, he was like, look, you can, you can sit here and negotiate this and drag it out for a month to make an extra hundred thousand dollars or $50,000 or whatever, whatever it would have been $25,000. Or you can go get to work and that $25,000 when you make it because of the extra time that you put in, is gonna, you're not even going to remember that. Mm-hmm. And that was the mentality I took, you know, thanks to my agent at the time. Um, and that was just such great advice. I think, like, we get caught up so much in, like, winning the deal and, like, you know, sucking every penny that we possibly can out of things. Like, sometimes we just got to put our head down and get to work, you know. And, and so that was a good that was a good nugget. But going back to what um, me and this lady were talking about is, like, the minor leagues, you know, you're with, you know, 25, 30 guys – you're in these small towns, you're in, you know, there is no distraction like from each other. So, you know, you want to go get in some trouble. You, you're all doing it together. You want to, you know, you know, you go to the field early, you're sitting in locker rooms without, you know, big TVs and it, it's not glamorous. It's just like the bare minimum. You know, you're eating peanut butter and jelly every day. You're eating McDonald's, you know, ramen noodle life, you know, and those times you come really close together and, like, I watch the Bulldoggers, right? And I, and knowing, like, I, th- I talk about this like I know what I'm talking about. But, like, I, I do see the Bulldoggers and, like, right. Tyler Wagg is back. I, I follow, like, I watch them. Yeah. And, like, these guys are le- legitimately behind the barrier or behind the, you know, box. Yep. And they're rooting each other on. And it's, like, if Rodeo ever got so big where these guys were all making a ton of money, like, and, they, I mean, the, the good ones do make a ton of money. But, like. Yeah, I mean, it's if, economy if it of got, scales, right? If it it's, got it's like not $14 million if it, contract. yes, exactly, and if it got that way, you know, you'd hate to see these guys be so competitive where they they begin to not root each other on. So going back to like you know the minor leagues is equivalent, I guess. I, I see so many comparisons to the minor leagues that I do to like the rodeo industry. Well, that's a good point, and I've always thought about that. Like not like big big time World Series baseball, but lower level baseball, still you know minor league, triple A baseball, double A baseball. It's a similar fan to rodeo. It really is. It I mean, really is a similar. But fan. but but why? I think because yeah. it's like generally they come from smaller cities with with a blue collar mentality. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're grinding and working for you know their money, and when they go to watch something, they want to see something genuine, and and they want to see it up close and personal. And I think that's what you get in the minor leagues. I think you get these guys coming out and you get something raw. Yeah, is it is it is it the big leagues? No, but it's completely genuine. And I think that's what draws me kind of to the rodeo world. And I think that's kind of what draws the blue collar, you know, everyday, you know, 
citizen blue blood American guy, exactly yeah. to rodeo and to like the, like you said to the minor leagues you know we're like I can appreciate that guy grinding it out and you know putting it all out there and it's not for the money yeah well I mean rodeo the, the I mean the highest earner in in professional rodeo this would be leaving out PBR the most money you ever won in one year is just a little bit over what like your your starting contract in the major leagues is you yeah. know what is what is what is starting salary? probably 575,000 like 575, yeah. or something like yeah. that yeah and i think stetson Wright, two events uh i think he, he won like 600 grand in one year and that's the most anybody in rodeos ever won in a single year so and it seems the, like he's in every single rodeo and i know he's got a bunch of brothers but like there's a right brother i feel like i yeah. mean we, we kind of are right we kind of like the rights you know yeah, yeah. And I mean, so, everybody likes them. So, like, you know, but I, I I did hear him say something, which I think, you know, I try to, like, hang on to all the little things. You know, he right. was like, you know, he said something like, uh, if I'm riding if I'm riding two a day, you know, I'm feeling pretty comfortable in the seat. You know, yeah. like, I kind of took that, like, he's not, he, he's riding, you know, he's getting out there. He's getting on him. You know, he's not, like, you know, babying himself. You know, he's not, you know, sitting in an incubator. And then, you know, going to ride, he, he's out there because he loves it. You know, he's he's putting it all out there, and he's he's kind of going with that, like, all-natural, you know, surfer bum type mentality is from what I see, you know. Yeah, I mean. And, and going rough, back to your turn, you know. Yeah, the rough stock guys, I mean, that it, it's such a – you've all these different events in rodeo. Yeah. But there's so much culture, it's just so different. Like, you're right, the Bulldoggers have that culture. It's such a unique, and there's just not that many guys who do it, so that's part of it. I mean, I think in any given years, there's like 70 of them, 80 of them in that top, you know, mm -hmm. really, that even have cards in Bulldog. I don't know what it is. It's probably like 80 dudes, right? But each of them has to wrestle their steer, and then a lot of them are hazing for each other. I mean, if you want to fuck somebody's day up, <laughs> you just don't haze good. Right. But no one, they never do that. Right. You know? Yeah. There's some honor in that. And, you know, it's the same thing in bull riding. They're pulling each other's bull ropes and all that. If you want to fuck with somebody so they didn't beat you, you wouldn't pull their bull rope good. But nobody does that. I mean, so it's the integrity of rodeo I think a lot of people like. And I think it's why people like college football more than the NFL because it hasn't been tainted with money and fame and those things. Not that those are bad things. I think they're good things for the right people. But Right. And there's, you know, there's good and bad in all of it. You know, I, I definitely agree, you know, going to that first rodeo and obviously got like a special seat, you know, riding with the 12 gauge, you know, but, um, you know, we, we walk in and never have seen anything like this before, you know, and like at the very beginning. You know, it's like, hey, we bow our heads and pray. You know, like, yeah. to me, that's like, whoa. You know, like, as a Christian, like, whoa, we got, you know, 20,000 people in here and, like, everyone's cool with us bowing our head and, like, honoring each other and no one's booing. No one's, like, saying, like, you know, kind of like the cultural type, like, I guess the common culture, like the world type, type view of it. Currently, yeah. You know, it's, and it's, it's kinda, hard. It's, it's hard being a Christian right now. Good Lord. But, but you know, yeah. it's it just goes to show, like, you know, like, Hey, we respect each other. You know, we're going to go out. We're going to do this our way, and no one's going to stop us. You know, yeah. like this is the way we do it. You know, it's kind of like hockey. You know, hockey they go out and f they go out and like they're you know fighting with each other and like it's an aggressive sport. But at the end of the sport, like they shake hands. Yeah, you know, every single time. And like there's something about a handshake to me that means something. And those guys can go fight, but they you know take their glove off and shake hands at the end of the at the end of the game. Guys, rock and roll denim has absolutely changed the game when it comes to the performance and style in Western jeans. Top competitors like Shad, Tim O'Connell, Shelly Morgan, you name it. Your boy right here. We're all wearing rock and roll denim inside and outside of the arena. It gives you the flexibility you need to win as well as looking absolutely great in your interviews, appearances, whatever it is you're doing. Even when you're just doing podcasts like me. I had a chance to go to Rock and Roll Denim's factory the other day and pick out all the pants I wanted. Here's the thing. I got to try on a bunch of their new jeans. I love the men's revolver jeans with the reflex stretch technology because they're comfy. They're not stiff like some of the other jeans. Go check them out at rockandrolldenim.com or follow Rock and Roll Denim on Facebook and Instagram for the newest trends in Western fashion. Rockandrolldenim.com. It's interesting, like, if you really think about sport and how long it's been a thing and, and what it's always kind of been meant to do and yeah it's a little tainted right now but it still does it right like it still brings people together i think that's one of the great things about baseball and rodeo i mean i mean if you really think about them they're, they're the two oldest 
sports in America. They are. Both of them. They've both been around the longest. I know rodeo probably has been around a little longer, but then it was baseball. I mean, baseball brought the entire world together in some of its worst and darkest times. For sure. Well, especially the United States specifically. But, For sure. And rodeo used to do the same thing. Yeah, it's not often that you can go, like if you look at like the makeup of a clubhouse and you see the cultures in like one like confined room, like in the in the world that I've lived in, like I don't see that diversity in a lot of other like industries, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's a pretty unique thing. You yeah, know, it you is. Get, you get those types of, you know, you you could on any given day. Like I saw Ken Griffey Jr. Um, my kids watch a lot of YouTube, and they were t- they were watching uh, Ken Griffey Jr.'s, I guess like Jersey retirement or whatever out in Seattle. Oh no, it was Jay Jay Buner was getting his number retired or something by the Mariners, and Ken Griffey Jr. was up there, and and he says, "You got this country guy who you know listens to uh, country music. He wears boots." Um, you know, drives a big truck. And then you got me, you know, with 17 speakers in my car, listening to rap music, wearing (laughs) baggy clothes. And then Ken Griffey goes on to say, like, but there's no person I would rather have raised my kids if something happened to me than Jay Buhner. So you've got two guys from, like, completely opposite spectrums and their brothers because of baseball, you know. Yeah. I'm sure that is the way that it is inside a rodeo as well. Yeah, except for everybody's wearing the hats and the boots. I think to a certain degree. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, there's other guys. I mean, there's guys. I, I see guys that are, you know, listening to rap music and everybody listens to rap well, music. Well, you know, I'm saying yeah. different cultures. You know, what I'm saying like absolutely. Maybe maybe the guys from the East Coast are a little bit different than the West Coast guys. I don't know. That's the oh, way it's absolutely. baseball for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think you just get that in everything. But yeah, I mean, that is a yeah. Good everyone point. certainly is wearing cowboy hats because I think that's like part of the uniform. Right? It turns out it is. Yeah. 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 And by the way, if you lose it, it's a fine. Really? How much is that fine? It depends on the rodeo, but usually like five hundred bucks. It ain't Dang. cheap. Yeah, yeah, it ain't cheap. Well, you're not getting fined like a Toyota Corolla like they get in the NBA. No, like, hey, here's a thirty thousand dollar fine for this. It's like two hundred fifty thousand dollar fine for that. Like, hey, yeah, I don't even watch. I'm glad baseball. Anymore. I'm glad baseball is not like that. What fines did they have in baseball? Um, I don't know. You get ejected. It's like a thousand bucks. They're really, they're really pretty, pretty, pretty minuscule. And like, you can put them to charity, so it's like really not a big deal. Really? You just yeah. write it off for your taxes? Pretty much. That's the ugly secret. No one yeah. ever tells you you can write off your fines. You can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I mean, so you, we've talked about it before, but when you started observing like rodeo a little bit, you had you had questions and, and, and you looked at the organizations and thought that it was strange, right? That these athletes had no representation, made no money unless they won it. I mean, wh- what do you think about stuff like that? And, and just so you know, if, this is going to go on the Cowboy Channel, whatever you say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, but I mean, <laughs> I, I think, I, you know, and this is like an outsider's perspective, and I'm sure it's naive, but, like, I think the Cowboy Channel is doing good for the Cowboy yeah, and for, like, the Western world, right? And I think they know with their success, they're also going to have some adversity, right? Like, the more publicity they give the Cowboy – the more I would imagine the Cowboy is going to lean towards representation. And the more that the Cowboy leans towards rep- representation, the more they're going to ask of the Cowboy channel and of like the PRCA. Well, yeah. I mean, and that's the Cowboy channel is one thing, right? Because that's just the network. That's the MLB network or, right. or whatever the equivalent to. Mm-hmm. And yeah, what they're doing is they're because some of the viewership's amazing. That for sure, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, like 40, 41 million viewers of the NFR, like that's just amazing for a rodeo, especially on a network that's the equivalent to the Golf Channel, right? Yeah, I mean, but but uh, it's growing, and that's what I see. You know, I think I kind of started watching rodeo, like, as the I, – I don't know how long the Cowboy Channel has been going. Just but a few years. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's kind of like the where I'm at as, like, a, a rodeo fan mm-hmm. is I'm kind of growing with the Cowboy Channel, I guess you could say. And it seems to me like the content that they're putting out is continuing to get, go deeper and deeper into like the Western world. And I think the more they do that, you know, it's not about, you know, advertising the 17 seconds, you know, that you're out there for your event. It's, you know, what you're doing at home. It's, you know, more commercials, it's more TV time. And like, as that goes up, you know, these 
I guess, endorsers are going to have to pay more. You know, and it seems like the writing's on the wall. And I, I think that's something that I've kind of talked about before with your family, you yeah. and your family is like, you know, at some point, you know, they're going to, the, the, the Cowboys are going to come together. And I feel like that's going to be a pretty powerful time, I think, for the sport. And I think for, you know, just personal gain, you know, you can only, you, and, and it's like you, you hate, you'd, you'd hate to see it as a fan because at that point it becomes like a business, just like all these other sports. And you're probably going to lose a little bit of the integrity, but you know, if you're a real fan, you want to see the people that you're rooting for do well. And I think nobody wants to see anybody have to go, you know, be on TV at the top of their craft and be going paycheck to paycheck. You know, it shouldn't be like that. Yeah. hundred percent. And I agree. And I've always thought that it's like the fact that, and, and to be honest, like when we were growing up and it was going to be rodeo, 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 for one, I wasn't nearly as dedicated as anything as you, other than like chasing girls and really chasing the girl who's now my wife. I was chasing her like crazy and she was like, get away from me, dude. <laughs> but the, like I cared about that more than anything. But when you looked at, especially like 12, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, yeah, fuck, old. But uh, when you look at that, like if you looked at rodeo as a career, it was like, I am not going to get to live the best lifestyle. And all of these people aren't. You just can't. Like unless you're the, the one percenters of the rodeo game, I mean, you've got these people who are somewhere between 16th place and 50 places who 50th place who lost their asses getting to those. Yeah. Those but I numbers. think, but and here's my, here's my issue too, is mm -hmm. like, and it's in the, like, I get like, again, I'm not, you know, please, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm, this is a naive point of view probably but like you know the people that i do follow and like the scene that i see is like I, I if there are you know people listening that want you know my point of view i think it's like hey you know like i listen to Derek begays and he's like he would pull up to his rodeos with like the worst trailer right that's probably the most sound thing to do you know just getting by on paycheck you know it, if you make fifty thousand dollars a year, and you're driving a hundred thousand dollar truck and you know a fifty thousand dollar trailer, you know, and you got who knows how much wrapped up in horses and travel and transportation, you know, like there's got to be some sort of like financial education going on, right? And I think that's something that I would say to a minor league baseball player too is like you can't just expect that you're going to make enough money to be an idiot spender, you know, like you're going to have to check these boxes because as the cowboy channel grows, like you're going to have to like, I, I don't want to say like lawyer up, but like, you're going to have to like put a team around you to, to get ready for it because it's coming. And you know, the people that are prepared for it are going to be the ones that capitalize on it. You know, I was talking to a guy, um, I think he actually, you know, he mentioned your family's name. Um, I, I've never met him, but your dad, Kelly. Mm -hmm. I guess he's got a horse in training with a guy named uh, Dusty Whitford. Mm. And I was talking to Dusty and his girlfriend last night, and they've got this thing that they're trying to, you know, grow. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, getting getting people more publicity and, like, growing followers and things like that. And it's like, as you continue to grow, like, what are you going to do with it? You know, it seems like it's the next truck, it's the next dually, it's the next trailer, it's the next farm, it's the next, you know, like, at some point you're going to have to come up with, like, a strategic plan by a professional. You know, I had to realize, like, I'm not a professional financial advisor. I can't handle this on my own. I have to hire somebody. And at that point, it allowed me to be freed up to do my actual job, you know. And I think that's something that I, I know it's a way of life, to go home and, and ranch and cowboy, but like, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected, you know, like you're going to get more money. Don't waste it on, you know. Yeah. Well, and it's so interesting, right? Cause you bring up a really, really good point. And like when you achieve the, the top, top, top levels in baseball, it's like you will by default get enough money to be set for the rest of your life. If you are smart with it, if you Correct? are smart with it, Correct? if you are smart with it, yeah. yes. And like, yes, but you can't do that in rodeo no matter what. 
Not yet. To, not, not yet. yet. But yeah. it's coming. Like, it, it's definitely coming. Like, mm-hmm. Tyler Pearson, right? Like, he's got I, – I watch him, and he's got this kid, his son, um, Stetson, I believe his name is, just by following. I think his name is Stetson. And uh, am I right? Do you know? Anyway. Um, bull riding, yeah. You know, he's um, – his kid's roping, and, like, by the time his kid is a pro, the money is going to be completely different. It's coming. Like, it has to. You know, the the Cowboy Channel, any if you watch it, like golf, you know, like you watch golf, like if you watch golf right now, you know, the PGA Tour is like kind of like competing with this live golf tour, right? And there's always competition. The more publicity, the more viewership, the more interest, like someone's making money, you know, it's only a matter of time before the athlete steps up and says like, you know, in the NBA, like, hey, this is a business, like, yeah, there used to be loyalty, and I'll be a Celtic or whatever for the rest of my life, but that was back then, and now these players are like, no, like you're not putting any players around me. I'm going to get my championship, and I'm going to get my money on another team. That is going to come, and as ugly as that might sound, it's inevitable. Like, It's 100% inevitable. Yeah, but it's also required, right? Like, If you're going to dedicate your life to a craft, which is to entertain people at its core, like that, and specifically in rodeo, let's say bull riding. Let's focus on just the bull riding for a second. You're you're cutting your life short. You're cutting your own ability short, and you are ensuring that when you're seventy years old, shit's gonna suck. You just are. It's like football. Like you're taking the risk of getting CTE and having your later years either be cut short or you're just totally screwed. You know, same with like boxing or any of these sports. It's like there's a risk and a reward for that, and you're checking the box that says, "Hey, at some point, I'm gonna be screwed up." No matter what I do, at some point this bull and Sage Kimsey made that perfectly clear. It's it's like it's not if you're getting hurt, it's when you but are going to get but, jacked but up. But there's there's a both. Yeah, there's a both and there. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's like my, you know, I'll say it to the minor leaguer, you know, so to speak. Right. Is like because I don't know the road, like I don't know the rodeo audience, but like, you know, you can you can do it for the pride and for the I made it, right but you can also do it to support your family and to, you know, make the correct steps to not just do it for just for your pride. You know, like you can yeah. do it for financial security. You like, should be, you should be able to, right. You should be able to. For sure. And I think if you have a numbers team, like it, it will certainly help you, you know, like absolutely. I, and, and, you know, just listening to Dustin, you know, pointer about this is like, you know, the first time he met a rotary out there, he's like, Hey, you know, what are you getting for that? you know, logo on your shirt, you know, a couple pairs of jeans and, you know, some, some gas money, basically, you know, like I think that if there's like proper representation, that never happens. Yeah. I mean, and you know, this is, this is a really good conversation actually, but to add more, more depth to it, one, one, and that's talking about endorsement money, right? The rodeo culture and the industry is relatively small compared to baseball, right? It's like the people writing those checks and giving those jeans only have so much revenue, right? So they're they're capped. The only way for them to get better is for their brands to grow larger, which is for them to grow larger. It means more people have to want to buy their shit. And it's not as the athlete grows. Exactly. As the athlete grows, their business is in turn also growing, right? So that's that's my pitch to the athlete is like, hey, instead of paying – you know, five thousand dollars for, you know, I don't. This is gonna sound dumb, but X implement for your tractor. Sure. You know, rent that, rent that service out for a hundred dollars, and spend the other forty nine hundred hiring someone to run your social media. Absolutely. You know, and take your following from five thousand to twenty five thousand, right? And then you can go to your endorser and say, hey, you know look how much, you know, an Instagram person can look at the analytics and say, Hey, you know, I've grown this much. And the proper representation will say that equates to X more dollars. Well, that's what we do. That's how we make money with the podcast is like, Hey, this is what we bring to the table. This is what we require to be paid for that. And, and everybody, people are starting to do that, but that's one side of the conversation. The other one is like, and this might be crazy, but there's certain rodeos and uh, you know who Fallon Taylor is, right? She's right there. Anyway, she, she before. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, she yeah. wears the helmet, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and the, yeah, the, anyway, the big, beautiful, like, you know, 
beautiful gowns or whatever, like, like all, the dazzly all, stuff. All you know? kinds of stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. her I brand. That in okay, fact, yeah. so much her brand that she's like probably one of the wealthiest people to ever have rodeo. Yeah, but she's got a brand. She's got a huge brand. And she's one of the few people who's figured out exactly what you're talking about. Well, she took it a step farther. She made the brand herself because there mm -hmm. wasn't one. But she's got checks from when she was rodeoing before they changed the age limits because she was like going to the NFR at like age 13 where certain rodeos paid the same in 1992 that they paid in 2022. So there's that endorsement side and build your brand side. But there's also, and this is where the sports are different, like the bulk of your money didn't come from endorsements, right? It came from your contract. Right. For me personally, yes. Yeah. But I do know players yeah. who are living 100% off endorsements yeah. and not touching anything that they're making from baseball. Yeah. You know, and it's just a sacrifice. Sure. It, it's just a, it's a decision. But if, but, if the, but if you're comparing like dollar signs, there, there's more money in that MLB contract than there is in the, the Nike endorsement probably, right? Like I said, like yeah. I, I think there is a an avenue Yeah, I could have taken – to say, hey, I want to build a brand. But for me, I preferred to be at the clubhouse early. Sure. Sit in there and hang out with the boys, tell stories, you know, and not be out doing a photo shoot or, like, you know, selling yeah, baseball yeah. gloves at Who Dick's at 10, 9 o'clock yeah. in the morning, you know, or, like, you know, doing that type of stuff. So right. it's, like, it was, for me, a decision I made that, hey, I'm not going to try to, you know, squeeze every single penny out of this lifestyle that I can. I'm sure. going to try to enjoy it and do it the way that I want to yeah. and make enough, just enough. You know I mean? more. I have more than enough. I'm not trying to say like, oh. No, I, I totally, just, I totally. You know, you're following what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, no, absolutely. It, but like there's this organ, and I, I'm not trying to throw the PRC under the PRCA under the bus, but, you know, it, there's certain people that people want to watch. It's just the facts. Yeah. People want to watch the bull riding to watch Stetchin Wright, Sage Kimsey, the Joss Frost, some of these guys, you know, if they're going to, to tie down rope and they want to watch Shad, they want to watch Tough Cooper, they want to watch Shane, they want to watch Marty, those guys. Same with the team roping. They want to watch Derek Begay and Junior Nagara and barrel racing. They want to watch Haley and, and so on. You didn't say her sister. That's messed yeah. up. Well, oh, yeah, Ivy, of course. <laughs> she's got she's got a very eclectic following, too. All it's right, like so sorry. I distracted you. Fan. Yeah, no, you. but they're, it's all pay-to-play money, right? And, and I just... The organization could change that, but they don't. They don't want to. But and the it, athlete could change it too. They can't. That's that's where I kind of feel like, you know, and not to be like Mr. Union, you know. I was, I was, was going to ask. But I think there's certainly, you know, you can definitely see it on the horizon, right? I mean. I don't know, man. I, like I, J.B. Mooney, for example, like dude is a badass you know like but man like he's going to like you said he's basically signing off saying like when i'm 70 like i'm screwed you know especially I mean? the way jb mooney does it and he's but, got a yeah. he's got a little boy you know what i mean like and a family right and he should be compensated by some sort of pension or some sort of something his family should have something other than like my dad was a really tough guy yeah because well, he's lucky because he's, he's, he's carrying a PBR, torch for, and PBR is so far ahead of rodeo. But yeah. but just just an example, totally. and that's like any other athlete, absolutely right, in this in this industry where it's like there's got to be some sort of like not it's not even a safety net. It's like a, a thank you almost like hey you know you helped us grow, you were a part of it. A recognition yeah, acknowledgement it's like social security for rodeo athletes. I agree a hundred percent. Instead, the best you can hope for is you know you get you get to be in the cowboy hall of fame and they get to go and sign autographs you know and do auto, like paid autograph signings and yeah you know you're still on the grind you're still traveling in a, probably in a trailer driving from place to place oh it's i mean it, not to be so doom and gloom and i would never say anybody's name ever but there is multiple multiple world time world champions who do things like work at feed stores or drive gravel trucks in the latter half of their career but i mean it's crazy but at the same time, like, I I mm -hmm. am completely envious of that, right. you know, like, to be able to just live a normal life, you know, like, to be blue collar, like, I grew up, like, yes, I have money, but like, in 2009, I made it to the big leagues in 2009. In 2009, I was selling Christmas trees on the side of a road in Sarasota, Florida. You know, my, my mom was a hairstylist, my dad, my stepdad detailed cars, like, you know, 
I laid, t- I was helping lay tile like as a job, like I was a bar back, you know, there, there is like some sense of accomplishment of like earning your beer at the end of the night. I like to say, you know, like there's days where like I don't do anything and I crack a beer open and I'm like, I didn't even earn this thing today. But then there's days where like I put in the work, you know, and I grind it. And it was one of those days where like, you know, I was outside all day, you know, fixing fence, you know, cleaning up fence line, blah, blah, blah. Right. I rode a couple horses that day. I mowed some grass and I got inside and I was like, I can have a beer. You know, I earned that. Or even when I was playing, you know, like a two for four night, my uniform is filthy, dirty. My ankle hurts. I got drilled by a pitch in the back. You know, I showed up early and I, I encouraged a teammate. And like at the end of the night, I go into the hotel or go into my house and I, I crack this beer up and I'm like, man, like you earned this today. You know, so I envy those guys who are still willing to put in the work at the feed store or willing to go back to the ranch and, you know, cont- continue that blue collar life. Right. But it can be both. And I think like once you get to a point where you find that freedom to say, hey, you know, I can I can financially decide what I want to do. I think I think these rodeo athletes are going to get to that point eventually to where they can do that, where they can say, hey, you know, yeah, I'm not going to put my life on the line anymore. I'm going to go back and, you know, I've got my pension coming. I've earned my pension. I've done this, done that, and now I can kind of do what's next. I agree. You know what's interesting is, is you think about, like, blue car, what, what like blue-collar people dream of. Right, like you're your real, your basic good old boy. Maybe they live in some rural town and they've got their twenty acres and they take care of their few cows, their few horses, they whatever the job. Yeah. Right, and, and they're always daydreaming of bigger things and bigger things. Like they might be daydreaming about your life. But the funny thing is, is when you achieve success, right? And most people who achieve success, what they end up doing is chasing that blue collar lifestyle. It's really interesting, right? Well, it's just never enough, right? right? It's never enough. So. You know, I dream like for me, my my journey was like I dreamed about, you know, I was in Little League, dreamed about playing travel ball. You know, I, I was in travel ball, dreamed about playing in high school. I was in high school, dreamed about playing in college. I was in, you know, I got, got a scholarship for college and I dreamed about playing pro. I, I dreamed about playing pro, dreamed about making it to the big leagues, made it to the big leagues, dreamed about being an all star, dreamed about being an all star, dreamed about getting a free agent contract, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's never enough, you know, and like, it, it was finally, I got to the point where like I was checking it. I can remember this day I was in Seattle, right? I've got, I've got four, three or four kids. I'm in Seattle. Part of my contract is you get a suite on the road and I go into the hotel room, like a sweet hotel room in Seattle, you know, like it's got the electric curtains and all that stuff. I mean, it's big, Swank, it's yeah. a big hotel room. Like it's nice. And I, I remember checking into the hotel room and put my stuff down and like, I went to the bathroom and I came out and like, I look and it's like this big, empty, beautiful space. And it's like, I'm sitting here by myself. Like not like the next generation of guys are playing video games. Like, you know, it got to a point where I was like, man, this is like the emptiest thing. You know, like, this is not like to be all like depressed, but it's like, this is, you know, I've been thinking about next, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next. And I'm here. And it's like the least fulfilling thing ever. You know, and it's like, this is brutal. Like I've got a family at home that like I'm missing my kids are missing soccer games or baseball games or, you know, they're out living on this grind of a life. And like, I'm sitting here like doing what, you know, like this is enough. So it's like the point is, is like next, 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 next. And now I'm at the point where it's like, you know, I did it the last. So, so Friday last week and then Monday, you know, I, I picked up a day working thing, you know, so that's kind of what I'm like. My, my thing is now is like, so I went and, um, you know, sorted some cattle on Friday and then shipped them off on Monday, you know? And like, I drove home from that. So like normally, normally what I do is I bring a cigar and like I smoke a cigar on the way home because it's just like kind of a thing I always wanted to do in baseball, but I never really did. Um, and then, so, so Monday I'm driving home and I'm like, you know what? Like I'm doing what I love again and I'm getting paid for it. You know, like, so I'm kind of like back at that blue collar thing where it's like, I'm, I'm climbing back up the ladder, you know? And so it's made it all the way to the top. And now, like you're saying, now I'm going to find that blue collar thing again. Yeah. That's a really interesting because you're right. And that's just like, I relate to what you're saying because obviously anybody who knows we had a really humble 
background. It doesn't look like that now. Um, but we did like real, real humble, like scary humble. And, um, so I ran from all that stuff so I could go to accomplish it. I'm still doing what you're talking about. Like, I just like, dude, I'm moving to Austin. I got to expand this company. Got to expand, got to expand. Mm-hmm. Not thinking about anything else. And it's different. It's not a sport, but it, it's still a similar process. And uh, I always ask people, always, like, when is enough enough? Like, when is enough enough? Yeah. And they always say, never. But they never finish that sentence. They just say, never. It's never enough. So they leave it. And it's actually business people who are really bad about this, I've, I've found is they leave it at it's never enough. Well, I mean, I'll be honest. Like, for me, it's, and, and, you know, you have, like, the material when is enough enough. But then, like, there's, like, the goal, and, like, the goal is to live off your interest, right? Like, when your money is making enough money for you to live off of. You know, does that make sense? Like, Absolutely. So if you spend $200,000 a year, when, like, interest on your money is that, you know, like, that's when enough that's for me when enough is enough like sure like you're in cruise control at that point right right from from a from a monetary standpoint yeah exactly but like as far as like the material stuff and like the lifestyle thing right you know if we follow if we follow like the world view like man instagram or whatever social media is going to continue to push you to be yeah if it was world view you'd have five ferraris in the garage not that that yeah, but then Ford you're gonna pickup. have to. Then you're gonna have to get the Bugatti, yep. you know. Like then Next. you're gonna have to get the yacht, and then yep. you're gonna have to go to Greece, you know. Then you're gonna have to go, you know, take all these cool pictures. You're gonna like, and then your life isn't even your life anymore. You got a photographer walking around, you know. Hey, you know, hey kid, smile. You know, it's like right. What is that? You see, like you see the sadness in some of those guys' eyes who do that, right? I used to really like Conor McGregor. I can't stand him now, just because he was on welfare and had a great story. And like, if you were trying to achieve stuff, you could latch onto that type of story. It's the same thing with Mike Tyson. Right, and you just see these guys fall on their face into a fucking pile of white stuff. Well, and it's like, and, and they're just miserable. Here's a Lamborghini yacht. Here's a picture of but me. But you think over about and over think about like Kobe Bryant, right? Like, yeah. And I don't know Kobe. I didn't follow Kobe. I wasn't like a Lakers fan. Like, but I can almost guarantee you that he would trade all his rings, all his money, and everything else for a couple more days with his family. Right? Like, absolutely. So, like, he's got the whole Mamba mentality. He's got all this stuff. Like. I, I I'm curious to know like would he change the Mamba mentality if he had an opportunity to come back? Yeah, you know like would he say like man like I was misguided you know like I was I'm no wait hold on you know really enjoy your family like do it a little different. I wonder if he would if he had the opportunity if he would say like no the this I still believe I still sign off on this Mamba mentality. Yeah curious you know it's one of those things i ponder yeah i mean i think about that stuff all the time because it is so easy to neglect the moments you just neglect them like if you have kids and you're really good about not doing it but sometimes i do it i just neglect like ah, yeah to, we'll, we'll do that tomorrow well shoot man i yeah. do it too like yeah hey, i'm not perfect by any means like hey there are plenty of times where my kids ask me to do something and i'm like hey you know just not right now there's yeah. a whole song by cat stevens on this yeah, yeah. Who's, who's Cat Stevens? Cat Stevens. I know who Cat Stevens is, but I don't know the song you're talking about. Cat's Cradle and the Silver Spoon. It's pretty much the the whole song goes about this father who who ne- kind of passed all this time. Say his kid wanted to spend time with him. He always passed by on it, and soon enough, he eventually his kid became just like him. As mm-hmm. soon as he was a father too, so generational curse. Yeah, gotta break the chain. Yeah, yeah, you really do, which is not easy, but. See, this is what I mean about you being humble and wise, and you're a lot of you're a lot of things. You're a good guest because you really seems like you think a lot about life stuff, and when you verbalize that for people who are listening, I think it's really valuable. I don't know, man. I just try. I think over the last couple of years, and this is like personal growth type stuff. You know, like over the last couple of years, like I really backed off the news, trying to back off social media, trying to back off like just like really just outside propaganda crap, you know, like people trying to influence my life, you know, there's algorithm algorithms for everything, you know, like how am I, what are you you going to put into my feed? What are you going to put on the news for me? Like I have to decipher, like I have to Google like what the people that I'm supposed to be believing in, you know, I have to fact check, you know, like, 
like, what is this crap? You know, like, so I just really just try to put my head down and just do what I do in the day and create my own opinion. You know, and I think that's kind of like where I'm at, where it's like, <laughs> at some point you're just going to have to trust your instinct and decipher for yourself, you know, yeah, who's BSing you and who's not. Yeah. I mean, really people, it's hard to do though. When people ask me like, are you Republican? You gotta be, I was like, yeah, maybe sometimes are you, are you a Democrat then? Uh, sometimes it's like, no, I'm a skeptic really is what I am. Like, do you really think that either side of these this side of the same coin doesn't benefit from getting you to buy into whatever their dogma is? It's like, you're right. And it's, you can only get that though. If you shut it all off. I think so. I think, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, like, you, sorry to throw you on the bus, but like yeah. when you're talking about bread earlier, like, yeah, you don't realize how much you don't need bread until you don't eat it. Yeah. And then, then when you eat it again, you realize like, man, that, it re really wasn't that good. Yeah. I eat bread, but I can relate to what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it, but that's everything. Everything is bread, right? In that scenario. And we are literally just being fed things to keep a machine going that we don't even understand. And but I, I think fun. it goes back to at the beginning of this when I said, when I was trying to say like, there's like the joy and then there's like the joy of like the feedback of what everyone else thinks that you're doing and what you're, how you're living. Right. Like I challenge you, like go on vacation and don't tell anybody and, and see how much you enjoy it. You know, yeah. don't tell your family. Don't tell like, don't tell your outside family don't tell your neighbors don't tell anybody just go out and have a vacation and see if it's like the best vacation you ever had i'm certain it will be yeah or or literally don't post what like, you're doing for a whole week like enjoy watching your kid not like this yeah like not watching your kid through this like really just like see your kid's eyes like your eyes and their eyes yeah and and see how much better that is yeah yeah i mean because people do it is and i find it to be super weird like, if you're one of these people, because I know at least a billion of you are this person, because you just can't help it, because you, you just, you have to. But really think about the reason that you're telling everybody on Facebook and Instagram every little aspect of your life. Why are you doing that? But it's like, it, it goes back to the same exact thing. Like, if you text me, and I don't text you back in five minutes, like, you might interpret that I'm mad. Oh, yeah. You absolutely. know, like, what happened to the day where, like, hey, man, like, I'll get back to you when I get back to you. You know, like. It's hard. I mean, I mean, like that instant gratification, that instant response, that instant sharing, like, oh, why didn't you tell me you were going to vacation? You know, it's like, dude, you're my neighbor. Like, you're not my child. Like, I don't have to tell you every single thing I do. Like, <laughs> dude, there, there's so that's a, it's a funny thing you brought up because uh, I didn't tell anybody anybody I don't like my mom just because my mom calls me incessantly which I actually like but like and a few people like that I was moving to Austin mm -hmm. they just somehow found like you're moving to Austin whoa what like yeah when it's like in three days yeah but think about how much clear the, much more clear the decision was for you oh the decision's right? made before somebody gets an opinion on exactly it. it's your wife it's you it's your direct inner circle and it's not like the the skeptics it's like you said skeptics it's not like the the outside distraction it's yeah this decision was made under sound state of mind and you know there's rest in that there's joy in that and like it's a new journey and it's your journey it's not your followers it's not the gauge podcast following it's not anybody it's like hey you know this is what i'm gonna do because this is the decision i've made and we've made yeah yeah i mean when, when you decided that you weren't gonna take that next contract that you had on the table from the rock it was the rockies right when you opted out of that last contract that they had for you? Well, it was you, really like I basically just didn't receive payment on a contract that I already negotiated. So I had a five-year contract, and I only played three years of it and left two years essentially on the table. Sure. I mean, there's like a little settlement in the backside of that, but yeah. So what really happened was like I had a five-year deal. I played three years, and after the three years, we had COVID, and it was like, man, like, I really don't want to go to the field every day and have a Q-tip stuck up my nose and do the vaccine and like do the quarantine and, you know, eat my breakfast, lunch and dinner in solitude and just go to the field and play and then go back and stare at the walls of my hotel room and not know when I was going to see my family again and not be able to bring my kids in the locker room, not be able to play in front of fans, not be able to interact with people like, you know, for me, it made it was baseball just, not baseball for you. It just made the life like 
it made like it was always a lifestyle to me you know it was always for me and what I found joy in yes it was playing the game but it was also interacting with fans doing charitable events and giving like getting to share the experience with people it was about like getting to share with my kids and my wife and my family like my like man there's no there's no better thing than to like bring your kids into the clubhouse after a win and see them dancing around and having fun and then going down to the batting cage and playing and chewing 400 pieces of gum and then throwing all the wrappers on the ground like <laughs> you know like that to me is what I was signing up for I made it to the big leagues in part for those things you know and then when you say like hey we're going to strip all that stuff back and what all we're going to do is go out and just play the game and it's just like to me that was like you know major buzzkill and I was like at that point like I, like I told you I was already kind of at the point where I was in the hotel room staring at the wall being like this is brutal and now you take all the fans you take you know COVID into effect and everything else I was just kind of like I need to take a hard time out on this yeah yeah it makes sense so I turned down a lot of money but at the end of the day like what I've gained I would not change anything yeah like yeah. zero regret that's great yeah, and I mean, being able to live without regret is probably, like, one of the greatest gifts you could give yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you know, have you ever sat or sat down with, like, maybe an old family member or somebody and all they have and what they use you for is just to try to process all the mistakes like and the look regrets? Back. Yeah, yeah. And because you get to that point in your old age. Have you been with somebody like that where, where they regret everything, they're constantly apologizing? It's really one of the hardest things in the world to it's probably not really of. probably not really family, but in the baseball world yeah. you get a lot of guys like you know, where they feel like the game was back like the game was unfair to them. Mm -hmm. You know, and you get those stories of like, I got screwed, you know, this coach did it, it was this person's fault. And in some cases that is the truth. But, you know, it's hard. Those are hard conversations to listen to for me because I always kind of felt like man you could have buckled up man like your back was against the wall like you could have done it yeah yeah and that's I mean that's everything in life really and you said it earlier but it, it really does just come down to the hard work right at the end of the day yeah I mean I I think looking back like looking now like you know people say like you know do you miss it you know that's pretty vague question but Super I, vague. I think what I miss is like I miss being a dog right like in a sense of like someone makes you mad you go out and you get them back you know you know this guy struck you out last time then you hit a homer off from the next time like I always talk about like the game like baseball will like slap you in the face and like for me there was no joy of no like more fulfillment than like slapping the game back in the face. And that was what I was always trying to do. Whether it was the game, whether it was another player, like I missed being the dog, like not, not taking a dirty slide, but like sliding in hard or like, you know, stalking a person's Instagram and like finding something like I really couldn't stand about them and like using that in my next at bat against them or, you know, talking trash from the dugout or, you know, just whatever, like being out there, being a dog, like that type of mentality isn't really in the real world. You know, like it's no, hard, not it's, in the everyday. <laughs> it's hard to like mentally pick a fight with like grass. <laughs> you know, you're trying to grow grass and it's like, man, you better start growing. You know, that's the great thing about horses. <laughs> well, is you can pick a fight. Well, with them. It's generally not advised, though, is it? No, but it's 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 not like, hey, let's freaking your host versus my fist. You're gonna lose that 99 times out of 10. But it's like, oh, you're not getting me off. Yeah, yeah, something like that. That's a, that's a, that's a good that's a good point. Maybe I need to start getting into like the cult. Yeah. Cult. Okay. So, well, I think I'm a little old for that. I don't think you're too old for that. I like I like the ones you're like, like you're like six years, five years, six years older than me. Like, you're, yeah. you're not too old for it because I was literally just getting drilled into the round pen not that long ago hmm. at the house. So, yeah. Actually, next time we have a Colt, you'll have to come out and go through that whole experience. Yeah. It's a beatdown, but breaking, breaking the Colt is 
you get a piece of that. Yeah. And I think the reward. That's my favorite part. The reward, of right, is like you did it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of get to slap back, you know, like that's yeah. kind of what we're talking about. Like, I like it. Yeah. I, mean, I never really my, thought about that, but that, thank you. That's my favorite aspect of training a horse. I don't, really, I don't really like the stages after that, but that first time you're saddling one and they're small enough as like a, a late two year old where you can push them around a little bit. I mean, if they really wanted to fuck you up, they could, yeah. but you can. And then that first time you throw your, your leg over them and they blow up on you, but you stay on, it's that same feeling you got in baseball. Yeah. So it's a fun train. It's a I fun like it, thing. I, that never, you can I never knew that. Onto. Now I got, I don't know if I'm going to do it, but. Yeah, why not? I might have to. I think you will. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. All right. Anyway, oh. I I think uh, I think the things that you were talking about are really wise. I think a lot of people will get a lot out of it. And I'm really glad you came all the way down here. I know we could have made it way easier on you and, like, done it in Florida one of the million times, but this is better. Yeah, this is cool, man. I appreciate, yeah. you know, first podcast, you know, my first podcast being on here. You, I think you were my first podcast. I know you were my first podcast I listened to. I don't think the iPhone 5 had the podcast thing on it. Yeah, but you know, so I would tra- I would you know go to the i I would go to the you know iPhone five for like my daily user, and then I'd have an iPad at home. Mm-hmm. So like I pull out, I'd pull out the iPad yeah. and like you know sit down from my chair and you know like a lazy boy kind of chair. No, my wife doesn't do lazy boy. You know, we got like the white chair. You know, like you can't get dirty. You got blankets on it. You know. Yep, that's wives. Yeah, yeah. As soon as like five kids, white furniture. Help me understand that, uh, dude. My wife is is pragmatic enough not to do that, but she really wants the white stuff. I do like the white couches, but I know what that means. I told my wife uh, yesterday, like, I think I'm like an outside dog. You know, like, I can't stay inside. Yeah. So, like, I'm always outside, and, like, I come in, all I really want to do is just sit down. Yeah. And I sit down in this white chair, and she's like, <gasps> Don't touch I'm like, the chair. I'm like what, where am I supposed to sit? You know the biggest mistake you can ever make if you start just doing a little bit, getting a little successful, is letting your wife walk into a restoration hardware. Biggest mistake. <laughs> Biggest mistake you can ever make. We're way past that. Yeah. I got way bigger. There's there's far more mistakes. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where it starts. It usually starts with bags, shoes, furniture. Mm. Big mistake. Yeah. You get that's to, I mean, if I could do one thing, just be, let's go back to coach bags and Michael Kors. Let's go back there. Mm. Let's get back to that. I tried to check. Like, my wife really wants to get, like, the, fl- the garage floors. So... She really wanted to get the garage floors like epoxied. Oh yeah, and so I was like, "Okay, you know, can you not if you don't spend anything on Amazon for one month, like no packages show up to the house for one month, we'll do the epoxy floor." You know, it's like we have packages showing up to our house. Did she pull it off? I think she might have, but she hasn't pushed for the epoxy floor. She's probably really? watching this, and I'll probably be getting. It's epoxy interesting floor. that the wife would want the epoxy floor in the garage, but she's like very. My wife is very. Like, anal about cleaning. Like, it's very. And so, like, you know, the garage floors. Do you have pets inside the house? <sighs> Sensitive subject. We actually just had two dogs run off. One got hit by a car. The other <laughs> one didn't come back. I can't I my wife up. went, my wife just went and brought a puppy, you know, back to the house. So we uh-huh. do now have an inside dog. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, she was very anti inside dog. And then the, the dogs running off, you know, kind of sparked this new dog mm-hmm. and like she's like all of a sudden like this huge dog lover she's training the dog by herself she's got the dog cuddled up on her all the time on the couch and you know so who knows what we're in for now we might be getting black furniture you know i don't know what's about to happen this is a whole new world anyway yeah this uh, pod- is this what normally happens on podcasts uh, start talking about random stuff it's my first one too okay all right. yeah but yes it usually gets it's usually more random this was pretty pretty on point so Nice. Just Proud ignore, of that. Just ignore the 136 that we did before this. This is your first one. Uh, yeah, but when you 136, take 136, like, is that what you're on? I don't really know. You're 137. But yeah, I, nice. I will tell you from That's this good accomplishment. From, from this side, if you uh, if you take like a two week break, it's like starting over. Yeah. Yeah, you got to really be on it because I'm like, oh, I don't really want to go do a podcast, and I'm done. I'm like, yeah, let's go do another podcast. Well, that's pretty. Yeah. That's pretty big time. Because I don't, I don't think know. you had done a podcast the first time that we met. I don't think this had started yet. I don't know. I, I don't so know you, when that so was. Do, do people don't know that you were you're basically my horse my my riding instructor. Yeah, yeah, but the, here's the problem. I did that, but then you like got bucked off. 
I didn't really. Was that bucked off? Would you call it? I, I don't. I, I'm not claiming that I've ever been bucked off. But if you tell me I've been bucked off, like I mean, and I you off? hadn't retired from baseball, and you got slammed into a fence, and I was like, but, "Fuck!" But I also rode like, you know, for the. I mean, that was pretty much like that was the first, first time. time. Like yeah. I was like loping around the arena. Yeah, you did on good. like a racehorse. You did really good. You know, there's not like there's not like slow horses at the 12 gauge ranch. No, and you guys no, are no. like, you guys are like, oh, get on that one. And was, I'm like, okay. They were like, are you really going to put Ian? I'm like, he plays, he'll be fine. <laughs> Five minutes later, boom, shit, are you okay? <laughs> like, I think it's okay. And then your leg, like, buckled and you fell. Yeah. It was really traumatic. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. for me, I felt like, you know. I you did get back, back on. I got back on. You did. And, you know, I was loping around on this horse. And, like, at that point, I was like, man, I never felt anything like that before. That was sick. I need that more. And yeah. I haven't really looked back since. So, thank you. You know, you kind of, like. No, yeah. Got me there. Uh, you did really good, other than the whole, like, the whole, fall the whole fence thing. But, yeah. you know, you got back on the horse, and that's the story yeah. everybody tells. Yeah. It's always like, you fall, you get back but on. But, like, I was pretty naive at the time. Like, now I look at the horse, the quality of the horse that they have there. You were pretty like, naive. I'll never, you guys I'll were never like, forget the, uh, the, horse trailer, the horse trailer thing. Huh. It's like, hey, should I buy this rickety old horse trailer? Nope, don't buy that. I have that mom, trailer. I know. I have that trailer, and I use that trailer, and that trailer is badass. I called you and was like, hey, should I get this trailer? And you were like, absolutely not. But I didn't take your advice, and that trailer is sick, and it was free, and I use you, it all the time. Yeah, I mean, all I saw was like oh, floors black that mold, were falling floors apart, falling off. But hey, black mold. But you know, one what? man's it trash out. is another man's treasure. You know, that's kind of the way I roll. Hey. I got, I got a horse and a trailer for two grand. That's true. Hey. That, that is the way you roll. That is the it way works. I roll. Hey, the trailer, that did, is the way wait, I roll. Did you have to replace the floor in that trailer, though? I did not. I did not. You got horses standing on those. I have horses. That ancient wood. I do. Just one day down the road, you're going to be like, where did my horse's legs go? Yeah, they're back on the floor or, or whatever the main road is. They're going out. I don't know. Hey. The, it's only a $2,000 horse. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I love that horse, and that's my son's horse. So, yeah. you know. was that the one that he was standing on? Yeah, he looks pretty good, dude. That he's coming along, man. We're I feeding mean, him good. Yeah, he's coming along. That's the horse that got cut on the thing. Oh, is that the one we, we doctored up? Yeah, so that's the other thing. You're my vet too. <laughs> Wouldn't go that far. I think I just rubbed. You're there for all the big out. moments in my all the big moments in my my horse life. That's a good point. First, what's ride, next? I don't know. We we'll podcast or Colt. We're going to start Colts. We are going to start Colts, and since I'm going to be out there, I've got a timeline of no less than 18 months. It isn't that far away. Yeah, before right, you're 40. Cool. Before you're if 40. you find anybody giving away free Colts in my house, and I'll start it for them. Not those kind. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do want to get into the breeding game, oh no, I don't. It's going to cost a lot more than a free trailer. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> and I a horse not. like that. But get on that. anyway, it's going to be fun. It's going to be cool. We'll do some cool shit. Sounds good. It does sound good. All right, we're going to let you get to the hotel. Cool. It's got to be like midnight, right? What time is it? 10 o'clock. Oh. This is a late podcast. Mistakes were made. I'm going to be up for a while. <laughs> Celsius. Uh, yeah, I was tired. It was a tired. I usually drink caffeine before we do the podcast. But those are at like 5 p.m., mm. maybe the morning. Yeah, not at 9. Whatever. Whatever. It is what <laughs> Sleep's it is. overrated. Is There's got to be some work that's got to be done. Something. But for him, he's going to be up all night editing. He's going to be up all night editing. It's not going to be fun for you. When is this supposed to go out? You don't want to know the answer to that. Mm. I'll, let you, I'll let you know later. We've had a lot of trouble with airlines, and it's been a mess. So tomorrow. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it is. I mean, we always do a same week turnaround or try to. That's going to change going forward with my are we still, schedule. Are we still recording this? Yeah, this is the bullshit that? part. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've heard of the bullshit part. We talked about, well, this is it. I know. What? Yeah, you enjoyed the podcast, and you're like, "How the fuck do these guys still do this?" If someone's still listening at this point, they're they're here for this. He's probably gonna cut it out anyway. If we take the headphones off, it can't stop. No, I don't need to. But I mean, are we? <laughs> what is that? Copenhagen. I mean, are we game for this or no? For Co Copenhagen? I mean, has has has, has anybody thrown a, a dip on this podcast before? You know, this is like a Western podcast. I know, but I'm just asking. The dip it? never leaves. Usually, on All most right, of the guys. Well, is wait, so that I gotta ask. To Here's the question because since you just pulled Copenhagen out of your front pocket, <laughs> I got some questions. This is my back pocket. Uh, whatever, whatever <laughs> yeah. pocket. I just didn't expect it. Okay. It, was that a is that a new thing since the cowboy lifestyle started? No. Or was this during baseball? I was a baseball player. You know, like I mean Yeah. No, baseball players are That's a 
Yeah, I mean, I've been it's touring really stuff big since one. I was 17, yeah. Is it, Sorry. Is it a lifelong? I haven't moved it yet. It's a lifelong thing? I don't know. I'm just saying. It doesn't look like you've been doing it since you were 17. Well, I'm sorry. I'm just saying. I was like, someone had to tell you. No, I mean, I, it's a, I was an idiot. It was a stupid thing to start, and now, you know, you're, yeah, I've you know, quit. My but, wife doesn't like to say I've quit multiple times, but it's really like I've kind of just like hard paused for a little bit. Is it the packet, or is it a little pa- I don't know anything No, this about is Copenhagen stuff. Snuff. I mean, this oh. is kind of like my flavor, I guess you could say. What well, flavor but is that? But it's like getting ridiculous. $9 for a can of Copenhagen? I mean, we don't need to get into all this. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I, yeah. So, Well, it's a... You just don't seem like the type. You know what? I'm really happy you chew Copenhagen. It adds to the layers. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. What do you guys think? I know Riley chews tons of Copenhagen. Oh, uh, you know you what? Chewed, have you ever, she have chews you ever red chewed man. Copenhagen before? You know what's crazy about her? She She's like a, a beech nut red man kind of So lady. my wife has had Grizzly. my wife has had a, a dip Grizzly. before. No. Just one. Yeah, she was a softball player, and I think it was like on the bus type thing. And oh, you married a softball player? <laughs> my, yeah, my wife is actually so many a better athlete. I don't know your wife enough to make the kind of jokes wife, I make at other. My wife is actually a better sport. athlete than I am. So, really? Yeah, she was a stud soccer player. Could have went to college playing soccer. Could have went. To, you know, she went to college for softball. Oh, don't tell like, me. She, she gave was a volleyball player. Dreams for you? No, she did not. Oh. No, she did not. That would have been really good. Like, yeah, she did. And you owe yeah. her for the rest of your life. That's why you have the white furniture and the epoxy garage floor. <laughs> I do owe her, but yeah, yeah. Well, I would, I would love someday. I'm going to ask her how hard it all has been for her uh, dealing with all your chewing and baseball playing. <laughs> yeah, it's been extremely difficult. I would yeah. imagine being a wife to a baseball player. That is. Yeah, I wonder what because the now that I'm home. Now that I'm home. Oh, mm-hmm. it's high. Divorce rate yeah. is high. But now that I'm home, like she goes to do something for like an hour, and I'm like, um, you need to get back. Well, you know, hurry. Like, <laughs> Where are you? How am I supposed to have these five kids for an hour by myself? That's a, you know, good, and like, that's a good point. And I'm on the road for two weeks at a time. You know, yeah. she's doing it. You know, so. That's one issue that like we as men have is we don't have a lot of empathy for child rearing. I've had to like read books on it. Because I've always been like, so? That's yeah, not the right, right way. That's not something I... And you have five. I do. Is she did two of, them, two of them natural. No. Two of them, the last two or the first no, two? No, I think uh, the first and the last, maybe. Really? Yeah. Huh. It was pretty sick, the last one. She was like, she was a rock star. The doctor was like, I've never seen anybody have a natural birth like with that much composure. She like barely even broke a sweat. It was sick. Yeah, but if, was, you, if, if you've had five children, it's like another day in the office at that point. She's pretty much a gangster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was it like in and out, same day? No, boom, no. Boom. I mean, I, that's, I think that's pretty illegal. No, I, I don't, don't think really you know. can really go in and out like that. I think it's like kind of like you got you to gotta stay there and do all the checkups. Didn't Fallon Taylor have her baby in a bathtub or something? That happens. At home? At yeah, that happens. My, my little sister, she's kind of like, you know, not a hippie, but, you know, kind of like that. Yeah. Um, she's she's an herbologist. And herbologist? So, herbologist? So she, herbologist? Yeah, something like that. She she did like the she did like the water birth, and she had like, I think it was like. That would freak me it out. It was like day. I think it, I, I want to. The number that came to my head was 30 hours, but I think it might have been 16, but, like, it was, like, long. It was, like, way too long. Like, you need to go to the hospital and, like, get the drugs and, like... Yeah, I mean, if you're out. sitting in the water for that long to try to have a baby, your Talk skin's going to fall off. <laughs> Prunes. It's not a normal baby after that. Does her kid look okay? He's awesome. Is yeah. he fine? Yeah, he's, like, he's... he's no pretty, weird... He's, he's pretty cool. Skin? No, man, he's awesome. Yeah, because I've heard he's water a, bursts, like, if you stay in the water too long, you get some weird skin. Really? No. Oh. <laughs> I've never heard that. Huh? For sure. Oh, yeah. That was born in the water. I'm going to die in the water. Born, he was actually born with web feet. Was he really? No. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, that is a medical condition. <laughs> it is a medical condition, but maybe only by, you know, you got to be in the water for like 40 hours. Well, that was dumb of her not to leave him in. <laughs> Who doesn't want an Olympic child? Right. Selfish, really. Yeah. Herbologist, come on. I don't know. Where were you on that one? You should have been guiding her. What are you doing with your finger? We're not allowed to bullshit? Jesus. You think you start a program and you want to have some control and then production, just like managers, tell you what to do. Yeah. I, you know, 10 o'clock is late. That's true. Riley's got to go home and ride some horses, apparently. That's what she was telling me on right here. You have lights at your place? I have a place I can go to. With Are you going after you not drop me off at the hotel? I was going to say, it's Texas in the summer. I mean, it wouldn't be unheard of. Yeah. A lot of night riding. Yeah, it is. It doesn't cool it's off. Only ni- it's only 93 outside. I hope you guys get some rain soon. 
So uh, we we're getting it. the opposite of rain. I know. It's like I literally, mean, yeah. elementally, the opposite. It's fire everywhere. Uh, seriously. I, mean, I saw a map where the, in like the next few days, there's rainfall in almost the rest of the country and just a circle around Texas avoiding it. It's sad. Uh, that's, that is sad. I mean, I, I, for real, I hope you guys get rain. That's. I love this place, man. Yeah. I only want to see good things for Texas. I had a, a great year here. I'm happy to be back. It was nice to get off the plane and kind of. You know, Smell feel. that Texas air? No, nah, man. I think it's just like it, I have good memories here, so it's nice to be back. You do? Yeah. Oh, is yeah. that is that what you enjoyed, like, out of your baseball career? Did you enjoy your time here the most, if you were like, going to say one place you liked the best to play? Um, yeah. I mean, it was – this is – Texas Rangers organization is absolutely first class. Like, for multiple reasons, it was a phenomenal year for me. Like, I had gone through – like, in 15, I had, like, a terrible year absolutely terrible that was my free agent year like i basically blew it bought the house next to your not next to your mom and and dustin and um tore the barn out put a batting cage in and like basically got to work free agency came like nobody was calling you know i kind of had this like chip on my shoulder the rangers called like i had to change positions you know it was like a complete hail mary and went out and absolutely killed it and, like, the Rangers were a huge part of that. You know, they believed in me. They brought me on board and, you know, trusted that I could take this new position thing on. And, you know, we had the best record in the big leagues. You know, and the Rangers fans fell in love, and it was a sick year. It was yeah. a really fun year. Fell a little short, but heck, yeah, man, I loved it here. I would, I wish I could have stayed, but it just didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. How did you handle the summers? Because that, that was before the new, new stadium. Yeah, but, I mean – for a Florida boy, it was nice. You know, like I was going every everywhere else I was going. You know, if you like, if you take all my statistics, like if you took my statistics, I was I think a, like a career, I don't know, two, two fifty, two sixty hitter, but I hit like a hundred in April because everywhere I played, it was like freezing cold in April. And for a Florida boy, I, I couldn't feel my hands. Like I, I was always thinking like something was like literally wrong with me, like. I was having some sort of reaction to the cold, and I think I was allergic to cold. <laughs> and so I came to Texas, and it was hot, and I was like, man, this is the best thing ever. You know, like, I'll play in 500-degree heat over 60-degree weather any day of the week. Yeah, you go play for the Rockies. Couldn't get more opposite. I know, but it was one of those things where, like, I wanted to, you know, prove something, and I don't know, an idiot. It was good. I enjoyed it. We made it to the playoffs a couple yeah. times. That was cool. Yeah. Favorite ballpark? Favorite ballpark? Oof, Philly probably. I mean, I, Washington was sick. Like, I really I really liked the Nationals Park. I really liked um, the Rangers Park. For sure, really liked the Rangers Park. But, like, everything that comes with playing in Philly. You know, I played, I played in Philly when they were, like, at their peak, and you would go in there, and it was, like, a battle zone. And that was pretty fun. I, you know, that park, that city is isn't really cool. Yeah. I think Dave at the Cowboy Channel was wearing a Phillies jersey on our he was. meeting. He's gonna be stoked to hear that. He was literally why did he say he was wearing it? We have weekly we have weekly meetings with the Cowboy Channel crew and he was wearing a Phillies jersey and he said for some oh, to piss somebody off. Face. No, somebody's <laughs> face. <laughs> Some guy's face. I don't know. He wanted to rub something in some dude's face. Probably had something to do with snuff. I don't know, man. It got yeah. weird. Very weird. It's getting baseball, weird. Baseball, man. Yeah, baseball is a very Baseball will make you weird. Yeah. How about <laughs> part, failing seven out of ten times? <laughs> and that's like you're really good. It'll yeah. Make you, it'll make you pretty crazy. That is a good point. And it's such a long season. So much man. play. 162 games. And that's not even including spring training. And then all the prep that you have to do with it, the off-season workouts and everything else. I mean, it's like year round really i mean you get like one month off yeah yeah i mean so did, so did you take your family on the road with you most of the time otherwise you would never freaking see him right no i mean so like the generation that i came up in you know it, it was you weren't really like it wasn't really cool to like bring your wife on the road you know that was like the guy's time that was like we're focused we're out you know going to play like we're not doing like you know museums and parks and things like that you know like yeah we're here to hang with the guys and like get come together and like be boys. 
but now it's like you know when I was finishing up, like guys were bringing their girlfriends everywhere. Like so, no. To answer your question, no. My like we didn't. They came on a couple road trips a year, but maybe two. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, it had to have been really difficult. It was. It's you know, you make a lot of money, but there's a lot that goes behind, like behind the scenes, just like I would imagine happens in the rodeo. Yeah, yeah. But they live out of the trailer, so they usually try to bring their wives and their kids. Some yeah. of them, not all. Yeah, of them. is that right? Some of them. Yeah, yeah. Some of them leave them at home, but usually for different reasons. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I have one more question. I saw that. I just like a baseball reference. You pitched one inning. <laughs> yeah. All right. I need to hear Did more. Did you see that. my ERA? Was that ERA? Okay. Earned run average is zero. I give up no runs. I threw ninety. My highest pitch velocity was ninety three, and I wasn't even really trying that hard. So I kind of feel like I could have been a pitcher. Your average exit velocity was like seventy nine. Seventy nine. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing, Ty. Yeah. What's ex- oh, oh, as a pitcher? Yeah, as a pitcher. Oh, as a pitcher. Yeah, yeah. I gave up one little duck fart, and. Yeah, the, yeah, they didn't hit them. They couldn't hit me. <laughs> oh, this Man, if you go back in the league, you I know what this position is now, you go to. This is now two podcasts. <laughs> yeah, hey. Part one, part when two. When you take the headset off, I'm following the lead. I'm just kind of like going with the flow. Yeah, because like, I don't know if it was the second beer or the, the dip mixed in, but you really you loosened up. No. I thought it was like midnight. And you said it was we're, 10 o'clock. We're, we're I was roll like, till midnight? We can do that. I just no. I'm going to run out of things to talk about. So if you got any sure. good yeah, ideas. I, like I said, I'm... Uh, we get we did we never really talked about which I thought you would bring up. Do you yeah. know the story of how I met Cody and Dustin? Probably has been told to me three hundred times. I just don't remember. No, no, I don't. I should. I'm a terrible. The, coo- son. the white stuff, cooler. Son. Yeah, that's right. The white cooler. I don't know the fuck. Okay. Is. All right. So, <laughs> so, so you know, I got this like back in the day, probably five six years ago. You know, Cody and Dustin move into the neighborhood and like. Their house, as it sits, you know, like you can't see anything. Like the the front of the the front of the property is like all brush. You know? Dude, the stupid roses in the and box that, is the dust. Hey, that is that is a tough. That Dustin kind of you know that's that's a little bit. He's not his the, style. It is. Actually. Is it? That's the problem, Dustin. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, the front of their house is like completely blocked. But you got to imagine like you live in this neighborhood, and like all of a sudden like. 12 gauge ranch is like blasted all over everything and you're like and you know you know who, who no one knows what the heck 12 gauge ranch is we're all looking at each other like what the heck is 12 gauge ranch and and so you know like it's like man what, what are these people like selling ammo like what, what is this business you know and so it's kind of got some mystery to it so i'm I, you know running walking by you know the front of the house and i keep on seeing this white cooler like down in the ditch in front of their house and I'm thinking, man, like, I really need to, like, it's a big cooler. And, like, I'm, I keep on thinking, like, man, I need to stop and look in this thing. You know, because, you know, there could be a baby in here or something. You know, like, <laughs> what's in this thing? Let me ask you how many days went by before you thought maybe I should yeah, look like, for this exactly. baby. Yeah, like, exactly. It was, like, and it, it kept on waiting on me. And it was, pro- it probably was literally, like, a week, 10 days, where, like, I kept on seeing this cooler and it wasn't going Maybe anywhere. the baby's alive. Maybe the baby's yeah. alive. Oh, yeah, this baby was way dead by the time. And so... <laughs> one day, one day I stop and I open this cooler and the whole bottom of it is full of blood. And so at that point I'm like, man, what the heck am I going to do? Like I'm on their property opening a cooler, like in their ditch, you know, like, <laughs> and it's full of blood in the bottom. Like, am I about to call it? Like, am I supposed to call the cops on this and like, you know, report this or what? So like I hit up Dustin, I forget how maybe Instagram, I, like reached out or whatever. I'm like, hey, you got to get out of here. Like, this is like a super awkward scenario. Like, I'm in, basically in your yard. I'm looking in this white cooler and it's full of blood. Like, what do you want me to do? I don't want, I didn't want you to drive down your driveway and see me like digging in your bushes and like see this cooler here. So, like, I'm in this. So, you contacted the potential murderer? Pretty much. <laughs> There's so many Pretty things much. wrong. First, you don't rescue the baby. Then and you reach tw- out to it's the, the psychopath who killed ranch. the baby. It's the 12 gauge ranch. And so I'm like kind of scared. Like, man, what, what the heck is this? What's about to happen here? What kind of rednecks live kind of, here? What it's kind a good of, question. What, what did you kill here? And so anyway, Dustin and Cody come out. They're really nice. And, you know, from that point on, my life has kind of been different. That's a good point. You fucked up. <laughs> I'm like country now. Very country, surprisingly. Oh, I know. I got cows and all because of that white cooler. <laughs> Yeah, and according to the HOA, I don't think you're supposed to have the I'm cows. I'm certainly not supposed to have cows, but my neighbors approve, and, you know, kind of is what it is. 
Okay. I had to get rid of the bulls because the white vinyl fence wasn't really holding them in very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, white vinyl fence and livestock. Don't I do really have go barbed wire in the back pasture, but I was restoring the back pasture, so I had to move them all up. You know what you're supposed to do if you want the white vinyl fence, right? You put hot wire on the inside of the I know, white but, vinyl you know, fence, like, Ian. I'm cheap. You are, which doesn't make any sense. Whatever, man. Replace the white vinyl yeah, you fence can't, as many times as you need to. You gotta, you can't spend it, man. You gotta save it. You, yeah. know, you gotta save the money. What do you think a roll? Of, well, it's probably more expensive now, but a freaking solar panel and a freaking pole and the hot wire fence is not that big of an investment. Uh, I, I, uh, I, you don't need. Whatever. You don't need it. You know, I didn't need it. I just got rid of the bowls. You know. That's a good point. They're probably in some cooler in some ditch now, thanks to you. No, actually, the guy, the guy I ended up giving him to, he. He was like, I had to get rid of them, man. They kept on breaking through my barbed wire fence. So nothing was going to hold those things. Set a steak knife. They're gone. The dinner plate. They are out of there. Had to be done. Well, baby's dead. 12-gauge ranch. <laughs> At least it gives people a better idea what 12-gauge ranch is because that's the, the one question that I constantly get is, what is it? What is your involvement in it? We just Why keep coolers it? in the ditch with blood. What, so what was the cooler no, for anyway? There's no we. Was, what was it for? Yeah. We no, no, who knows? <laughs> I think it's a secret that Cody and Dustin are taking to the grave with them. Somebody on that property knows what that white cooler is for. And, and I don't know how we're going to get to the bottom of it, but maybe that's like the next podcast. Yeah. The white cooler. Probably not. I had a, uh, I had a third step sibling. Does this no get more. cut? Does no. this get edited? I don't think we'll do that. No, not this time. But we're going to start the... We're going to do some creative moving we're going to start with the white cooler story <laughs> yeah and then we're just going to do some weird stuff we're going to mix in the bull thing we're going to paint you in a really bad light that's fine kill babies kill animals the good thing is like white none couches of yeah. yeah it's no fine. particular order whatever first and last podcast right <laughs> 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 well i think it is a good time to call it right. yeah boom This has been The Gage, hosted by me, Chance Conrado, produced and edited by our guy Ty Yeager. Shout out to the executive producers, Dustin Pointer and Cody Denton. Marketing and content produced by Riley Chone. Make sure to rate and review this podcast as well as follow The Gage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gage wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys next time.